Today on the Ginger Engine, we will be reading and reviewing the Three Railway Engines book, the first book in the Railway series written by the Reverend W. Audrey that was published on the 12th of May 1945. Will our quote unquote normie give it a yay or a nay? Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> Welcome aboard the Ginger Engine. First of all, we need to check your tickets. And how do you do that? By hitting the big subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. We'll always be sure to keep the trains running on schedule. Today, your driver will be myself, Andrew Durning. Your fireman will be... Thomas Lawrence. And we have travelling alongside us our very important passenger... Fran Martin. So, Thomas, Fran, first of all, welcome to the pilot of uh, Railway Reviews. How are you all keeping? Good. I'm good. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, good, good. We also have Matthew Hilly from Scuffed Studios, who's kindly letting us use our premises. Uh, yeah. How are you getting on, Hilly? All right? I'm great, thanks. Last time I spoke to you was when we were doing the Flower of Scotland cover. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, what fun that was. Yes, yes, the nationalism was, was rife. <laughs> that day was rife. So, Fran, we go way back, back to the days of the, oh. the acting, like the college school, theatre mm, school. Childhood dramas. Yes, plenty of adult dramas now as well. <laughs> well, you've got a, a wee boy, Leif. Yes, he's a two-year-old two uh, wee rascal that yeah. I love. Cal? Him. Cal. Cal. So just Cal. Just Cal. Cal. Because I was going to say, was it one L or two? Because I've got a wee cousin called Cal. Wee cousin, but he's 16. And then he, well, he's one L and I always go, Cal with one L. Uh, so. <laughs> he gets that a lot though. He, you'll say, well, this is Cal. And go, hi Cal, how are you? And he's like, it's Cal. It's Cal. <laughs> and that's fine. Brilliant. And Thomas, well, we've actually met through the Thomas community. Yes. First time actually meeting face to face. Exactly. I think we're probably the only Thomas fandom that I've ever met face to face. <laughs> well, because we're all very, we're all very insular. Yeah. You know, I've noticed we always like to keep ourselves to ourselves, but I wanted to branch out to the, the Thomas community. Exactly. Well, and you're from Scotland, so having two Scottish Thomas fans that are over the age of 18 is like finding Bigfoot right in the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do first before we dive into the content is get a little bit about everybody that's come together for my next insane project. Thomas, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I'm 21. Before dreaded Covid hit, I actually was an entertainer on a holiday park. But prior to that, I'd done various pieces of acting, musical theatre, pantomime. But yeah, I just love to perform. And also getting to rediscover Thomas again during the pandemic also led me to branch up my voice acting skills by doing some of the TV series as well. Yes, be sure to check out Thomas Lawrence's YouTube channel. He has done several redubs of the classic era of Thomas and Friends and some other projects that you've worked on. Yes, I also run my own theatre company as well where we do shows to raise money for our local food bank of uh, Patrick Food Parcels. That's brilliant. So what's the name of the, the production company, the theatre company? We're called Feed the Dames and we do musicals and pantos pretty much every year if we can afford it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's absolutely brilliant. So how did you discover the love of Thomas and Friends? We, we done an interview on uh, my That Metal Ginger show. Feel free to check that out. But for those that are new to this channel, well, give us a wee bit of insight into your, your love of Thomas. Well, never going to show how long ago it was. Going back all the way to about 2001, I was going out with my mum and like she was trying to get me into something just to watch on TV just so she could get a bit of peace and quiet. And her friends at work were like, oh, Bowie Boys, like this show called Tom's Tank Engine and Friends, why don't you get that for Tom's and see if he likes it? So she went to Woolworths without me one day and got and they just released the complete fifth series as a video box set for about 15 quid actually which was like it's <laughs> quite dear for videos back in the day mm -hmm. yeah but i suppose it as well if you think if it being a full series then it's fair enough a wee bit but like yeah twi the twi cause they're 26 episodes aren't they yeah oh that's not bad then. so she got that and basically then i was just showed it to me and i'm looking at it first going hmm I'm not sure. It's on tape one of the VHS and then the moment the theme starts, I'm just then hooked and I just don't move from the TV screen at all. That's probably what and you saying you kinda of rediscovered your love of Thomas during the pandemic. Was it purely just I want to get some more people on my YouTube channel, let's see how it goes? Because it's fairly taken off, especially mm. among the Thomas fandom. Mm. Well, it was actually mainly because when I actually did get my job as an entertainer last year, I actually was having to think about maybe rebuying the DVDs 
which I ended up doing. Mm-hmm. And I just watched that and I thought, I wonder how this is sound if I was doing it. And then it was like, I then found every some of the Thomas YouTubers online who'd done like clean track versions of certain stories. And then I tried it and then I thought, should I upload this? I don't want to get slammed to the channel. I think the first ever redub I did put up was Off the Rails. So I put that up. Good show. <laughs> I put that one up and then literally I found the Thomas group and then I put that in there and then everyone's was going, oh my god, this was amazing. You literally something like cross hybrid of Ringo Starr and Michelangelis. So, and oh, then that when... is a brilliant compliment. That's <laughs> one of the highest compliments you can get. I know, I was literally just like, and I commented back with a wee joke comment saying, well, at least you didn't say Alec Baldwin and Michael Brandon. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Nothing against Alec Baldwin in season five, but no. after that it was just... No, no, just, just, just stop. <laughs> yeah. So this is obviously stuff that our Thomas newbies don't really know about, so that's a good segue to lead on to Bran. So aside from the fact that they'll hopefully have listened to the intro videos, if you haven't, I suggest you do, where Fran said, I'm really just here for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Who that, said like, that? Not me. No, just understand, well, you've got a holiday coming up. <laughs> uh, so, for, in all seriousness, why have you actually agreed to be a part of this insanity? I mean, we are paying you. Uh, <laughs> apart and from the well, money. I, and we're paying uh, Hilly for the use of his uh, lovely studio. But what I, what intrigued you about the project in the first place? I think, well, I've, like, like I say, I've got a wee boy who's two, um, and he's quite into Thomas the Tank Engine, or I don't know, whatever it's called these days. I'm not the biggest, uh, I don't have a lot of knowledge on Thomas uh, the Tank Engine and all that, but he's got uh, into the newer kind of versions of it, and all kind of updated, um, all the new theme tunes, all the new characters, all that kind of stuff. I don't care what any parent says, you watch it in the background, right? You do get a little <laughs> bit into it, right? And it's very, very different from the Thomas that I was familiar with growing up. And, it, and I just was really curious when he came to me with this project. I thought, well, I'm, I'm quite curious to see how it's developed and how and why there is such a fandom for it and, and what, what the kind of backstories are all about. And um, yeah, and I've not done obviously any acting or a lot of work through COVID and, and the pandemic and everything. So I just thought this would be a nice way, way to kind of get to know the characters a bit more and get to do a wee bit of voice work and a wee bit of and get to know it. I can look forward to it. Yeah, it's good. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, well, in particular, Fran, that you agreed to do it because one thing that I have noticed about the Thomas community, there there aren't a lot of women yeah. in the Thomas yeah. community. Not to say that there aren't, because there are. They're just don't, not, their voices aren't as heard. Yeah. Well, especially when it comes to things like, you know, when the, uh, I watched like, the great model railway shows yeah. and there was uh, a team a lot of older women that competed and it felt like they were treating them as a novelty. Yeah. And I didn't like that. I understand where that maybe comes from because when we were kids, it was boys that were into Thomas the Tank Engine. Do you know what I mean? And we're talking maybe 30 years ago, but when we were kids, it was always boys that were into that and girls were maybe into more stereotypical, you know, My Little Pony or whatever was on yeah. at the time. But Thomas the Tank Engine was very much a wee boys show. And like, like that with merchandise and things like that, if you're looking at pyjamas or, you know, lunch boxes or things like that you send for kids, you don't often get girl stuff that's got Thomas the Tank Engine on it, so like that, it's always boys that seem to be in there. So. Yeah, and it's one of the things that hopefully this will break down that stereotype, because one of the things that Thomas is very much criticised for in the community was that there was a lack of female representation, mm-hmm. or, if it was, or if it was represented, there were all stereotypes. Now, that in a way is true, Yeah. because there were yeah, female engines, but in, especially in the early days, they were stereotypical, what, um, kind of uppity, prissy kind of characters, yeah. mm-hmm. but it evolved over the co- over the course of time, and hopefully, if we get further down the line, yeah. apart from the pun, we'll, we'll be able to <laughs> we'll be able to actually prove that. Matthew, you've been kind of just roped into it because I thought <laughs> you're here. I don't want you sitting <laughs> on your tods. Well, you might as well come and join us. Well, I'm all about in- including everybody. So I suppose I can. Help. Look as a wild card. I mean, honestly, Thomas was really never really a big hang for me when I was a kid or anything like that, and obviously, kind of subsequently, hasn't been for me growing up either. The um, um, levels of playing field then two on two. Yeah, of course. But, I mean, I'm interested because you just had our discussions so far today talking about some of the maybe like um, more adult themes and stuff like that are, that are in some of the later books. Uh, it was quite interesting to me how like kind of older what we would consider kids TV or kids uh, media can sometimes have those kind of 
like maybe not darker, but like more adult themes and and like more like kind of fable sort of thing. Yeah. Like, when I think of like a fable, it's like, like it's got a message behind it yeah. or something like that. So I'm kind of interested to see yeah. that yeah. kind of side of things. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you'll definitely find out is that Thompson Tank Engine has bigger lore and backstory to it than fucking Middle Earth. <laughs> but, I, but, I'll t- but I'll tell you that the world building in Thomas is actually ridiculous like, of, how, of how good it is. For anybody that is just tuning in, especially to this, I'll give you a rough description of what this idea is about. I'm a massive Thomas fan, or at least I thought I was a massive Thomas fan until I got into the Thomas fandom and realised I'm actually minute in scale. <laughs> Thomas has such a large adult following that I never knew existed and if you've listened to my intro that was one thing that always made me feel really alone as a child and as a teenager I got told that Thomas is just for babies, it's just for kids, you're not that anymore, you've got to grow up and move on and I thought I did but the love of Thomas never really fades as every fan knows once, once you're in get in and when I got into my kind of twenties my girlfriend at the time had bought me a Hornby Thomas the Tank Engine train set which is still not out of the box because I wanted to keep it nice and my love for Thomas kind of came back and I wanted to re-embrace it so I got the DVDs, I got the railway series books, I've got a couple more collectibles and I was I was just enjoying having that but I still felt quite lonely. It felt like I couldn't talk about like having these little parts of my personality it still felt quite taboo. So I went on to the Facebook well, as I got a bit older, I was in my, as I got into my fairies and had my, my own two children who I love very, very much. Although I pray you never listen to this. <laughs> well, I wanted to, wanted to try and find some adults who maybe had the same passion as me and I was so surprised when I joined the Thomas Facebook group as, as Thomas has mentioned that there were so many people who felt the same way as I did that Thomas wasn't a kids show. Yes it may be that now but it wasn't what it was intended to be like there was a lot of kind of adult themes and content and context to it that even I didn't know about and seeing all these other YouTubers that have put out their content about it like, <coughs> their, like their own versions of the stories like their own reviews and analysis I thought I should really try and do this but I don't want to be another kind of generic Thomas knockoff. Well, I wanted it to have a wee bit of an edge, a wee bit of a, a hook, a gimmick, a unique selling point, if you will. <laughs> and that's when I started thinking, what if we got a quote-unquote normie in, well, and see if we could try and sway them to maybe appreciate the Thomas lore a bit more. Well, <laughs> it, it's, an, it's an ambitious challenge and an ambitious project, especially not only the fact that we've got somebody as in the Thomas fandom, but also, as I said, female, who isn't really represented in the Thomas community. Mm-hmm. So it gives us a lot more of a unique perspective. And having that kind of selling point, with that, I thought, well, what should we do? What what would make it make this work? So one of the things I've just mentioned is Thomas has like, a massive war and a massive following behind it, like, and lots of, lots of history and context. So I've got one of the Thomas fandoms, essentially Wikipedia, Luke Bainham, who knows everything there is to know about Thomas, everything behind what the engines are based on, their real life stories, and how they came up with the concepts of the of the story work. So we're going to have a, a little learning segment. We'll do an abridged one for the show, but then we'll do a full proper video of it if you want to go and look into it in a bit more detail. So we'll go into the history behind it, then we'll do a narration of the books, which Fran has very kindly agreed to be a part of. Um, Matthew's still on the fence, we'll see We'll see how he goes, uh, we'll see what he thinks. Can you see how my accent works there? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously uh, Thomas is what, a chameleon of accents, he's, a, he's absolutely brilliant as you'll find out and then you've got me, sorry about that. <laughs> so, we'll read the books, we'll do the narrations, again they'll be put on a separate video if you want to listen to them individually and then we'll do a bit of a review and analysis. Thomas and I will do it from the fandom's perspective and Fran and Matthew can do it from the normies perspective and at the end we will do what I call Fran Ye or Fran Ne. <laughs> and we will ask our Thomas Normie whether the book gets pass marks or it, it fails. And we're going to do this by each illustrator's era and we're going to tally it up and at the finale episode, once we get to the 26th book, which feels like a lifetime away, but trust me, <laughs> it will get there quite quickly. And we can determine once and for all if the Railway series in particular is, quote, just for kids or everybody can appreciate it. So how are we all feeling about 
my pitch about my idea. Excited, actually. Very excited. <laughs> yes, I, I knew you would be, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really what? Really curious, what? I think. I feel like every day is a school day here. It's just something that's been in front of you for years and your whole life that you honestly didn't know about all these themes and all these these things, these kind of darker or more adult things that are in uh, Thomas that, that I had no idea about, so I'm really excited to learn it all. Yes, and, uh, Matthew? Well, like, kind, of, kind of likewise, yeah, I think it'll be interesting coming to like, like, just having the kind of initial surface level, I, I guess, understanding mm. you, like Thomas, mm -hmm. and just like as a, like another cartoon, or like if that makes sense, yeah. like it just seems like because it's not something that I followed hugely, mm -hmm. um, it's just something that's kind of passed me by. So it'll be interesting to see if maybe, um, maybe do I do get. <laughs> yeah, you know. turn, turn you to the the, mm -hmm. the dark side dark of the force <laughs> well, or we, we think it's the light side yeah well, obviously we think mm -hmm. it's the light side and if you know what anybody that maybe would want to be a part of this experiment that maybe hears the idea and goes hmm maybe i can get in on this we're always looking to expand what and try and convert we're not like mormons or anything <laughs> but, but the more people that kind of develop a better understanding the less alone what people like myself and Thomas might feel Aye. it's that's really the main goal is to just give a bit of knowledge a bit of understanding and so we don't so the Thomas fandom don't feel a bit like you know lepers we'll be going round the door soon as well just <laughs> yeah, yes. I do want to talk to you about the uh, the church of Reverend W Audrey <laughs> so we'll dive in and we'll start off with the learning with luke segment so for all the new people tuning in this segment is called learning with luke this is information provided by Luke Bainham, who I personally call the Thomas Wiki, and he has given us a lot of information from behind the scenes of how the Three Railway Engines book was conceived. It was written in 1943, and the Reverend Wilbur Audrey came up with the story to read to his son Christopher while he was sick in bed with measles at the time. In 1945, his wife Margaret encouraged Wilbur to publish the stories, and they were constantly rejected until Edmund Ward agreed to publish the stories. But he only agreed to publish the stories on the basis that Audrey included a fourth story where Henry got out of the tunnel and he wanted all the engines on the same railway because Audrey's original vision was to have them all on separate railways. Neither Audrey or Ward liked the original illustrator, which was actually William Middleton, not to see Reginald Dolby as a lot of the fandoms believe. William Middleton was hired through connections from Edmund Ward and he didn't like the illustrators because they were too simplistic in terms of drawing and scale. And due to these errors, he was fired. And in 1949, C. Reginald Dolby re-illustrated the first book and all others in this era. The character of Edward was based on a heavily modified Sharp, Stuart and Co. larger Seagull K2 class with a 440 wheel arrangement. Gordon is based on Sir Nigel Gresley's LNER A1 Pacific design from Doncaster Works, which for any newbies is the same design as the legendary Flying Scotsman with a 462 wheel arrangement. And Henry is a bit more of a complex backstory. Audrey originally wanted Henry to be a 442 Great Central Robinson Atlantic. But Middleton illustrated Henry as a 462, very similar to Gordon. And for the next book, Reginald Payne came in as an illustrator and also got Henry's design wrong again. But that's another story for another book. Thoughts? Hmm. Yes. I had no idea that they were really specific about the design mm -hmm. of each of the trains and, yeah. and, and argumentative about it almost. Yeah. Audrey wanted his designs to be as realistic as possible mm -hmm. to real steam engines uh, and it was something that if the illustrators hadn't gotten these designs so wrong in the first place it was probably one of the good reasons why the realism came into Thomas so it's, it does it has a long and complicated history because these yeah. obviously these aren't the original mm -hmm. illustrations these were the ones that were redone <coughs> by, by Dolby and it gives you a lot of kind of more insight into what his background and how, yeah. it's, how it's came about. So that's only like a teaser of the stuff that Luke has gave me. Like I said, he has provided me with so much knowledge. I thought it, I thought it was quite interesting, um, the publishing of it, because mm -hmm. I 
structure was quite specific as well. You can understand like the creator and the author being this is work at the end of the day and he mm-hmm. wants to be quite specific with it, but you know the fact that he wanted to make sure the trains were run, like on the same line and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it says to me that maybe the publisher kinda actually seen a bit more of the potential with what it would become. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, the the, the, f- the further books and like things like toys and other merchandise and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Well one of the things that was interesting was one of the stories in it, the sad story of Henry, at the end Henry gets bricked up in the tunnel and left and that was why they wanted an additional story because they wanted a story where he got let out of the tunnel essentially like a, a character nah. redemption no, but, Aud- but, yeah, but Audrey, didn't want, Audrey didn't want that he just wanted him to be left in the tunnel so yeah it was, it was pretty dark exactly cause it, but also like as well they then adapted that story the sad story of Henry in 1953 for the BBC but then Audrey watched it because it was a live broadcast they did it but like one of the engines came off midway through the live recording and basically then basically just to make sure it still ran they actually had someone's hand actually put it back on and Audrey like phoned up the BBC afterwards going what the hell did you do that for ah. he was raging by it so they cancelled the next story yeah. Audrey, Audrey was he was very very pernickety mm. uh, a lot of people call him an eccentric yeah, mm-hmm. but then again, we know from the performing arts, if you're not eccentric, <laughs> you're not good at it. Exactly. <laughs> you're not good at what you do. Well, and he was very good at what he did, mm-hmm. because these books are still read over 75 years later. Yeah, exactly. Can you imagine like a Paw Patrol or a Shane <laughs> the Chef having that type of staying power? No. No. Well, no that's the sign of like, like proper art to me. Like, yeah. It's something that's got that staying power. Like, yeah. It, it's it's a not classic. just. The mind. This is this is 1943. It was first done 1945. Yeah. This is pre-war. Like everything is yeah. destroyed. There is no. T- there isn't such a thing as social media. There's no real marketing. There's no real presence for anything, especially with children's books yeah. at that point. I think you meant post-war actually, Andrew as well. So it, it was post-war. No. <laughs> I would normally edit that out, but I'm going to keep it in because it shows that I'm not perfect. <laughs> but, and I, I do like having those wee bits in as well. It makes it more authentic. You're <laughs> like, what, what war was I talking about? <laughs> yeah, which, which war? There's been so many. There's so many. Well, pre-Cold War. Exactly, yeah, right. <laughs> there we go. Thomas has once again saved my blushes. That's why we got a real expert. <laughs> <laughs> so, are we ready to dive into the narrations? Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. Edward's Day Out Once upon a time there was a little engine called Edward. He lived in a shed with five other engines. They were all bigger than Edward and boasted about it. The driver won't choose you again, they said. He wants big strong engines like us. Edward had not been out for a long time. He began to feel sad. Just then the driver and fireman came along to start work. The driver looked at Edward. Why are you sad? He asked. Would you like to come out today? Yes, please, said Edward. So the fireman lit the fire and made a nice lot of steam. Then the driver pulled the lever and Edward puffed away. Peep, peep, he whistled. Look at me now. The others were very cross at being left behind. Away Edward went to get some coaches. Be careful, Edward, said the coaches. Don't bump us and bang us like the other engines do. So Edward came up to the coaches very, very gently and the shunter fastened the coupling. Thank you, Edward, said the coaches. That was kind. We are glad you're taking us today. Then they went to the station where people were waiting. Peep, peep, whistled Edward. Get in quickly, please. So the people got in quickly and Edward waited happily for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. He waited and waited. There was no whistle. No green flag. Peep, 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 peep. 
Where is that guard? Edward was getting anxious. The driver and fireman asked the station master. Have you seen the guard? No, he said. They asked the porter. Have you seen the guard? Yes, last night, said the porter. Edward began to get cross. Are we ever going to start? He said. Just then a little boy shouted. Here he comes. And there the guard was, running down the hill with his flags in one hand and a sandwich in the other. He ran to the platform, blew his whistle and jumped into his van. Edward puffed off. He did have a happy day. All the children ran to wave as he went past and met old friends at all the stations. He worked so hard that the driver promised to take him out again the next day. I'm going out again tomorrow, he told the other engines that night in the shed. What do you think of that? But he didn't hear what they thought, for he was so tired and happy that he fell asleep at once. Edward and Gordon one of the engines in Edward's shed was called Gordon. He was very big and very proud. You watch me this afternoon, little Edward, he boasted, as I rush through with the express. That will be a splendid sight for you. Just then his driver pulled the lever. Goodbye, little Edward, said Gordon as he puffed away. Look out for me this afternoon. Edward went off too to do some shunting. Edward liked shunting. It was fun playing with trucks. He would come up quietly and give them a pull. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa! screamed the trucks. Whatever is happening? Then he would stop and the silly trucks would go bump into each other. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa! they cried again. Edward pushed them until they were running nicely. And when they weren't expecting it, he would stop. One of them would be sure to run onto another line. Edward played till there were no more trucks. Then he stopped to rest. Presently, he heard a whistle. Gordon came puffing along very slowly and very crossly. Instead of nice shining coaches, he was pulling a lot of very dirty coal trucks. A good strain, a good strain, a good strain, he grumbled. The shame of it, the shame of it, oh the shame of it. He went slowly through with the trucks clattering and banging behind him. Edward laughed and went to find some more trucks. Soon afterwards, a porter came and spoke to his driver. Gordon can't get up the hill. Will you take Edward and push him, please? They found Gordon halfway up the hill and very cross. His driver and fireman were talking to him severely. You are not trying, they told him. I can't do it, said Gordon. The noisy trucks hold an engine back so. If they were coaches now, clean, sensible things that come quietly, that would be different. Edward's driver came up. We've come to push, he said. No use at all, said Gordon. You wait and see, said Edward's driver. They brought the train back to the bottom of the hill. Edward came up behind the brake van, ready to push. Peep, peep, I'm ready, said Edward. Poop, poop, no good, grumbled Gordon. The guard blew his whistle and they pulled and pushed as hard as they could. I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, puffed Gordon. I will do it, I will do it, I will do it, puffed Edward. I can't do it, I will do it, I can't do it, I will do it, I can't do it, I will do it, they puffed together. Edward pushed and puffed and puffed and pushed as hard as ever he could. And almost before he realised it, Gordon found himself at the top of the hill. I've done it! I've done it! I've done it! He said proudly and forgot all about Edward pushing behind. He didn't wait to say thank you, but ran on so fast that he passed two stations before his driver could make him stop. Edward had pushed so hard that when he got to the top he was out of breath. Gordon ran on so fast that Edward was left behind. The guard waved and waved but Edward couldn't catch up. He ran on to the next station and there the driver and fireman said they were very pleased with him. A fireman gave him a nice long drink of water and the driver said, I'll get out my paint tomorrow and give you a beautiful new coat of blue with red stripes. Then you'll be the smartest engine in the shed.
The Sad Story of Henry. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. He went into a tunnel and squeaked through its funnel and never came out again. The engine's name was Henry. His driver and fireman argued with him, but he would not move. The rain will spoil my lovely green paint and red stripes, he said. The guard blew his whistle till he had no more breath and waved his flags till his arms ached. But Henry still stayed in the tunnel and blew steam at him. I am not going to spoil my lovely green paint and red stripes for you, he said rudely. The passengers came and argued too, but Henry would not move. A fat director, who was on the train, told the guard to get a rope. We will pull you out, he said. But Henry only blew steam at him and made him wet. They hooked the rope on and pulled, except the fat director. <clears throat> My doctor has forbidden me to pull, he said. They pulled and pulled and pulled, but still Henry stayed in the tunnel. Then they tried pushing him from the other end. The fat director said, One, two, three, push! But it did not help. <clears throat> My doctor has forbidden me to push, he said. They pushed and pushed and pushed, but still Henry stayed in the tunnel. At last, another train came. The guard waved his red flag and stopped it. The two engine drivers, the two firemen and the two guards went and argued with Henry. Look, it has stopped raining, they said. Yes, but it will begin again soon, said Henry. And what would become of my green paint with red stripes then? So they brought the other engine up and it pushed and puffed and puffed and pushed as hard as it ever could. But still, Henry stayed in the tunnel. So they gave it up. They told Henry, We shall leave you here for always and always and always. They took up the old rails, built a wall in front of him, and cut a new tunnel. Now Henry can't get out, and he watches the trains rushing through the new tunnel. He's very sad because no one will ever see his lovely green paint with red stripes again. But I think he deserved it. Don't you? Edward, Gordon and Henry Edward and Gordon often went through the tunnel where Henry was shut up. Edward would say, Peep, peep, hello. And Gordon would say, Boop, 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 serves you right. Poor Henry had no steam to answer. His fire had gone out. Soot and dirt from the tunnel roof had spoilt his lovely green paint and red stripes. He was cold and unhappy. And wanted to come out and pull trains too. Gordon always pulled the express. He was proud of being the only engine strong enough to do it. There were many heavy coaches full of important people like the fat director who had punished Henry. Gordon was seeing how fast he could go. Hurry, hurry, hurry! He panted. Trickety truck, trickety truck, trickety truck! Said the coaches. Gordon could see Henry's tunnel in front. In a minute, he thought, I'll boop, boop, boop with Henry and rushed through and out into the open again. Closer and closer he came. He was almost there. And cracked. Whee! Shh! He was in a cloud of steam and going slower and slower. His driver stopped the train. What has happened to me? Asked Gordon. I feel so weak. You've burst your safety valve. Said the driver. You can't pull the train anymore. Oh dear, said Gordon. We were going so nicely too. And look, there's Henry laughing at me. Gordon made a face at Henry and blew smoke at him. Everybody got out and came to see Gordon, mm. said the fat director. I never liked these big engines. Always going wrong, send for another engine at once. While the guard went to find one, they uncoupled Gordon and ran him on a sliding out of the way. The only engine left in the shed was Edward. 
I'll come and try, he said. Gordon saw him coming. Huh, that's no use, he said. Edward can't pull the train. Edward puffed and pulled and pulled and puffed, but he couldn't move the heavy coaches. I told you so, said Gordon rudely. Why not let Henry try? Yes, said the fat director. I will. Will you help pull this train, Henry? He asked. Yes, said Henry at once. So Gordon's driver and fireman lit his fire. Some plate layers broke down the wall and put back the rails. And when he had steam up, Henry puffed out. He was dirty, his boiler was black, and he was covered with cobwebs. Oh, I'm so stiff. Oh, I'm so stiff. He groaned. You'd better have a rod and ease your joints. And find a turntable, said the fat director kindly. Henry came back feeling better, and they put him in front. Peep, peep, said Edward. I'm ready. Peep, 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 said Henry. So am I. Pull hard, pull hard, pull hard, puffed Edward. We'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it, puffed Henry. Pull hard. We'll do it. Pull hard. We'll do it. Pull hard. We'll do it. They puffed together. The heavy coaches jerked and began to move. Slowly at first, then faster and faster. We've, We've done, done it together. together. We've done it together. We've done it together. Said Edward and Henry. You've done it. Hooray. You've done it. Hooray. You've done it. Hooray. Sang the coaches. All the passengers were excited. The fat director leaned out of the window to wave to Edward and Henry, but the train was going so fast that his hat blew off into a field where a goat ate it for his tea. They never stopped till they came back to the station at the end of the line. The passengers all got out and said, Thank, Thank you. you! And the fat director promised Henry a new coat of paint. Would you like blue and red? Yes, please, said Henry. I'll be like Edward. Edward and Henry went home quickly, and on their way they helped Gordon back to the shed. All three engines are now great friends. Wasn't Henry pleased when he had his new coat? He's very proud of it, as all good engines are. But he doesn't mind the rain now because he knows that the best way to keep his paint nice is not to run into tunnels, but to ask his driver to rub him down when the day's work is over. That's us everybody, we have done the first book, the three railway engines. So what we're going to do is we'll do the reviews and analysis from both sides, from the Thomas fandom side, so Thomas and myself, and from the normie side well, of Fran and Matthew. I actually want to start with Fran and Matthew first, if that's okay, because all the Thomas fans will hear, hear probably what everything we have to say, Aye. whereas on the other side it's going to be completely different. What did you honestly think? Did you take charge on this one? <laughs> <laughs> hey, isn't the old saying ladies first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You were the narrator, you had more this to do. This is true, this <laughs> is true, fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think it was very, very interesting to see how, for a start, Thomas hasn't been introduced yet, right? So it was like, Where's Thomas? <laughs> I thought this was about Thomas. <laughs> um, yeah, very, so was, very common among the, ah, the normies. Very it was common, like, very wait a minute, is this am I reading the right thing? But no, I liked how it was. You didn't quite... make it sound prickish there, by the way. <laughs> 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 you normal people. Um, no, no, but I mean, I, I, I thought it was quite. It was darker than I expected straight away. I mean, they kicked right in there, but didn't they, with the dark stuff, like mm. the, you know, like like um, like locking him away and stuff like that. And I thought. Okay, where's this going? To, like, where's this going to go? I thought that was going to happen later on, and they would like break in gently with the stories. But no, I really enjoyed it. It was quite great. It was it was great for kids. Mm. I think kids would like. I'm saying for kids, that's terrible. It's not just for kids. But <laughs> it's all right. But this is, this is a good thing, though. Uh -huh. Let's just get yeah. back up our point. But I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think no, I, I really enjoyed it, and I, and I think from the reading it, you're maybe you're maybe looking at it from a different point of view as well. From when somebody's just listening to it, I think mm. as an narrator, you're kind of 
you're getting into each of the characters, how and why they're doing certain things or saying certain things, and you're kind of getting into their, their per each of their personalities individually, and you get to know the characters really quickly doing it like that as well. Mm. So it's like there's there's maybe like a cheeky one, or there's a smart smart Alec, or there's a you know there's somebody that's a bit of a bossy one or whatever. And I think that that's important again for kids to see that there are going to be people in life that have those certain personality traits, mm. and it's showing that quite quite quickly. That you know, there might be somebody that's a bit of a bully, or there might be somebody that's a bit thinks they're better than everybody else. Or, but it's, it was also nice how they ended each of them to to see how like there's always a conclusion. So it's like, and they can you know they conclude that it was actually nice to, um, to they've learned something from each you know each of the characters have learned something from this storyline, and, and mm. I think that's kind of the main thing at, at this point. Yeah, All right. So you were narrating, so you were what in it a lot more. Matthew, you very kindly jumped in for a couple of the voices, but you did get to have more of the, the listening yeah, aspect yeah, to it. Yeah, a bit more passive, passive role, we'll be able to just take it in and stuff like that. Right. Kind of, so how did you feel like listening to all of us doing it? In terms of uh, your performance or <laughs> the, 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 the story? Well, just, just like the general like, the performance in the story, yeah, I don't want to say, you've got to have a good yeah, performance yeah. to bring the story. That's true, that's true. <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting, like touching on what Fran said about the, the kind of the morals of the story that it tries to give you. Um, it does kind of give you that, but it's still kind of like quite vague. I think like it's, it's not like does it at the end go this is the moral of the story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it kind of leaves you kind of up to that to figure out yourself. Like when Henry gets bricked up in the tunnel and it, and it asks you the question, you know, do, do you, you think, think he deserved it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, and maybe you could argue, argue that in both ways. Do you know what I mean? Maybe, yeah. Maybe he was being quite petty and picky with his paint and everything like that. Yeah, there's room for debate, isn't there? You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly, which I, I think it's interesting for what people would consider a kid's book because you wouldn't normally have that level of, like, kind of introspection, like, that introspection, like... Analysis? Cere cerebralness, if that yeah. makes sense, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know that but, um, kids' books always make you think so, like, in-depth or, like, so kind of... Like, our kids' books are always in the black and white, good and evil. Yeah, like, do you get yeah. what I mean? Whereas it's kind of like grey, there's, there's no oh, right or wrong. Uh -huh, it's, it's realistic, really. I mm -hmm. mean, not everybody lives happily ever after. Not everybody, mm -hmm. not all the baddies end up dead, and not all the goodies end up living. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think you need that kind of those grey mm -hmm. areas, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where it was interesting, like you said, when they were like, when the narrator was saying, I think he deserved it, do you? Well, you know, it's, it's like some people might go, I know, totally, and other people will go, no, no. It's terrible. I think that's what it was. It's again. It's down to individual. Not there is no absolute right and absolute wrong. Mm. It's like it's each individual. What have you done to deserve this or not? So it's, it's like rather than just telling you what the lesson of the story is, it kind of it's leaving for you to work that through it's in your open mind. Which would, uh, but that, I think that kind of like almost that's almost better in a way because it's making you actually rather than just telling someone that something is bad and, mm -hmm. and that's it and you shouldn't do it because it's bad. Mm -hmm. It makes you actually think and, and come to that conclusion yourself mm -hmm. that this is bad because of that or this is bad because yeah, of that. Yeah, lets them pick. The, it lets people make their own decisions about the characters without it being rammed down your Yeah, throat. and I kind of I think you know kids are like you. Know, anybody's like you tell somebody to do something, they'll do the opposite. <laughs> Whereas if you if you come to that conclusion by yourself, then maybe that's actually like a, a kind of better way to learn. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the illustrations, like the artwork. What did you think of like of like the style, like the art? It was very much like what I remember as a kid, um, having seen, like I said, my wee boys too, and he's he sees all that when you look up Thomas on YouTube or whatever now, it tends to be all that that new style, and they're very 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 different now looking um, and they're good but this is but the, this is very much the Thomas that I would think about and I think people my age and older um, would, would always picture these kind of these illustrations I think it's it's quite it's like it's raw it doesn't need to be perfect if that makes sense it's yeah. not airbrushed and perfect it's it's just it just takes me back anyway as a kid uh, because it does look I'm, I'm assuming it was originally all hand done um, yeah you can tell that and you can see like mm -hmm. the craftsmanship and the work and the the art that's put it's into making the illustrations. Yeah. Mm. Whereas I'm not again I'm not too tuned down with the current Tommy stuff, but just in general with cartoons nowadays, um, and with the technology that we've got where everything's generated on computer, it's just everything's perfect, perfect. nowadays. Mm. Um, but even there if you look at the, the rails kind of, like, character. The rails there are 
absolutely perfect. You can tell they've kind of painted a hand drawn, so like things like that. It just and, seems and, and more reminds real. me like the drawings remind me of like the railway, like in real life as well. If that makes sense. Ah, like, mm-hmm, like that. So we'll jump over to to us now from Thomas' fan perspective. That is really refreshing to hear. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like because these are these are things that we would be like, aye, aye, we've been saying that to people for years, and they've all went, you're talking rubbish, mate. It's a kid's book. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Because it's like, whenever you mentioned anyone, like, oh, I, I don't mind Thomas and Friends. It was it was still good and stuff like that. But then they were like, why do you still enjoy that? It was for kids. And then, you're like, and then you just have to be like, not always it wasn't. <laughs> exactly. Well, and the illustrations themselves, well, I always liked Dolby style because it was so vibrant but like the colours were really bright which wasn't common in that time period when it was produced it was all it had more pop and more kind of <coughs> rhythm to it exactly but, but the stories themselves here like Edward's Day Out isn't really properly adapted for like the TV series no literally because if you were like I think I'm assuming you were like me that we watched the TV series first because that was just when our generation yeah. got it and then went to the books yeah, I had the series first, and then I got the Railway Series books when they re-released them as like the compilation albums on the 60th. Yeah, so so did you find it quite interesting reading them and going, oh, there's bits here that I never knew, I never knew about, like the like Edward's actual day out. You only yeah. see a very brief moment of it in the TV show. Yeah, because Ed and Gordon, they literally just paired off the two stories just yeah. to put it as one. Combine the two to make it into one. Sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. I, I think with it as well, it was just more reading the books in general, like, you could definitely tell there was like, loads of stuff that they'd either gone, oh, let's actually put this at the end of this story, or let's put this here. Because, like, the first bit of Edward Gordon Henry, like where it said, poor Henry, I don't see the answer, his fire went out, they moved that to the end of the sad story of Henry when they adapted it for the television. Yeah. I also like the fact that, um, well, this first book is the first one where there isn't an author illustration. Obviously, because that was him starting out. Yeah. But the rest of them have, maybe have, like, a wee two to my son Christopher or to this or to that yeah but and you could tell that the writing was more geared towards children yeah for the start because they were kids books but as you go on but into the books the writing starts to evolve just probably just as Audrey was getting better with his his craft and his creativeness yeah but he, he grew up with his audience Exactly. Like through it and it's, the, it's shown in the illustrations and the writing style mm. like, and his comfort mm. with his content really and I think as well you can tell obviously with the first book as well being like the first book it was like simplistic stories as well a wee mm. bit but like while still having the realism and the yeah. Yeah, cause darker still, cause tones a couple of them were still based on real life events like. yeah because it's like the three rare engines it was like because I was used to always skip that book when I was younger because it was like I liked the more stories where there was more going on yeah. Whereas, like, now when you look back, you actually go, eh, these aren't too bad, or stories, actually. Yeah. No, considering what, how it started out, considering it was 75 years ago at the, yeah. at the time of this recording, well, it's absolutely, it is brilliant to look at. Yeah. Well, now that we've finished our railway reviews, it is time for the final decision. So, what we are going to be doing is that we get our very important passenger to give each railway series book a yay or in May grading. So thumbs up or thumbs down. At the end of each era, so for example this is the Dolby era that we're starting with, we'll tally up each grading and for the final episode we can determine once and for all whether these books were best for adults and children. Fran, you have read the book. Yes. You've done your narration. Mm -hmm. Are you giving this railway series book the three railway engines a yay or a Definitely a yay for me. She gave it a yay, folks. Gave a she yay. gave it a yay. We are off to a flyer. Just like the Reverend W. Audrey was all those years ago. Dolby is one in the yay column. Yay. How are we feeling about that, Thomas? Actually feeling good. Yeah. It's nice to know that we can actually now say to adults, it's not for kids, we can prove it. <laughs> yes, we can prove it from an entire one episode. But of course, there's going to be lots more episodes coming. If you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about the latest videos. We will be back next week for Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. So from everybody here, this is your driver, Andrew Durning. Fireman, Thomas Lawrence. Narrator, Fran Goma. 
extra Marty Hill. <laughs> 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 yes. the, the, ver- you're the very important passengers. Very important passengers. <laughs> yes. Until next time, take care, stay safe, bye bye.